If you're new or visiting, we're working our way through the book of Revelation. Right now we find ourselves in this, uh, Jesus addressing the seven churches, and we find ourselves in the third church, which is titled, in my Bible, the Compromising Church. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says, He who has a sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent. Notice Jesus saying, repent. If you read the Gospels, in the very beginning of the Gospels, one of the Gospels, Jesus says, repent. As he starts his ministry, repent. If you're new here, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the word repent means to turn, to turn from. In other words, you know you're sinning. You know you're sinning. I knew I was sinning. I didn't know how to get saved because nobody explained it to me, but I knew I was sinning. I knew I wasn't going to heaven. I knew I was falling short. I knew all those things, but I didn't care. But once somebody explained to me the gospel and that I could go to heaven free, that I could be forgiven of all my sins and that the Holy Spirit would clean my life up and take away those fleshly desires, I said, yes. And at 17 and a half years old, I received Jesus as my savior. And that transformed my life 46 years ago. So if you're here today and you don't understand that basic principle, I want you to know God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. You can receive Jesus as your savior. The Holy Spirit will literally come within you and then empower you to overcome those things that you know you're doing wrong. But you don't know how to, you know, it's not positive thinking. It's not positive confession. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone and on a stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching. I pray for open hearts or our souls, that our, that our personalities, that our souls would be open to your word this morning, that we'd allow your Holy Spirit to, to lift our spiritual eyes to heaven, to, to get our eyes off of the darkness and look to the light, knowing that we can be saved. And those of us who are saved, that we can repent. And those who have repented, that you'll keep us on the straight and narrow. That's, that's your responsibility. Your Holy Spirit will keep us on the straight and narrow. Our responsibility is just to confess that we might receive that forgiveness. So, Father, bless the word this morning as we continue in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we move through the postal route of these seven literal churches referenced here, we have some unique characteristics that Jesus is addressing. So here's a little map. It might be kind of hard to see, but you can find this yourself. But we just wanted to throw this up there so that you'll see where those seven churches are. And, I, and there was tighter maps, but I wanted this one because it shows where, uh, I can't even see way back there, where Joppa and Caesarea uh, is. So where is Israel today in relation to those seven churches? So we'll leave that up for a minute or so. Ephesus could be classified as the church that lacks sincere love. Not the whole church. And as again, as we look at these verses, we don't, or if I say something from the pulpit up here, I only have so many minutes to share. Sometimes I might say something and I don't always say this, but you know, sometimes we say things and we say it with a wide brush. You have to be mature enough to realize, okay, he's painting with a wide brush. Not everybody in Ephesus lacked love. Not everybody in Smyrna didn't want to go through persecution. There were those who did. Not everyone here um, in, uh, where are we at? Pergamos is compromising. But we want to be open to what? What we read the very last sentence, the Holy Spirit. 
we got to be open to the Holy Spirit. Am I open to the Holy Spirit? And as we go through these letters, these, these churches, we want to be open to the Holy Spirit. As Smyrna could be classified as a persecuted church. And this week, we're going to look at the church in Pergamos, and they could be classified as the compromising church. Now, a little history lesson. We want to get this history to make it relative to today because it is real. When I see these things, picture America. Pergamos was located about 40 miles north and 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. So you can see that up there. Its name comes from two root words. Listen to these root words, the definitions. One of which means tower or fortified structure. And then the second word means marriage. Marriage. That plays into what Jesus is going to address to his letter. So a fortified structure, a tower, and then marriage. You see, Bible-believing Christians are referenced in the Word of God, male and female. Every Christian is referenced in the Word of God as, a, as the bride of Christ. And we always think of a bride with a veil and a white gown. No, this is just imagery. We are all, male and female, we're called we're the bride of the church is the bride of Christ. Get that in your, pick, in your mind as we go through this, because a bride, the church, is to remain pure, male or female. We're to remain pure. So we need to guard that relationship and never allow anything to compromise that representation. So whether you're a male or a female, check out of the normal, oh, gown, white, no, no, check, forget that, and think of purity, purity. As male females, we're to be pure. We're to seek the pureness that God would have us to have in our lives, whatever that looks like. Pergamos was also an extremely religious city. It had temples to the Greek and Roman gods, Diocinus, Athena, Demeter, and Zeus. It also had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor. Some 50 years before Smyrna, 50 years before Smyrna, won the honor of building the first temple to Tiberius, the city of Pergamos won the right to build the first temple to worship Caesar Augustus in the province of Asia. This city was especially known as a center of worship of the deity known as Asclepius. Asclepius was the god of healing, was the god of healing represented by a serpent on a pole. Let that sink in. There was a medical school at his temple in Pergamos. Because of this famous temple to the Roman god of healing sick and diseased people, people from all over the Roman Empire flocked to Pergamos for relief. The imagery was probably stolen from the time of Moses during the wandering years. You'll find that in Rome, Numbers chapter 21. Well, I've never read Numbers. I get it. But you want to read Numbers. You want to read from Genesis to Revelation. Read, read, read. And you're going to find phenomenal stories in Numbers. But this specific story, number 21, one commentator offers this information. Sufferers were allowed to spend the night in the darkness of the temple. In the temple, there were tame snakes. In the night, the sufferer might be touched by one of these tame and harmless snakes as it glided over the ground on which he lay. The touch of the snake was held to be the touch of the God himself. And the touch was held to bring health and healing. Superstitious, right? And we would think, oh, how silly superstitious. Uh, this popped into my mind, uh, Diamondbacks, baseball. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but when they went to and won the World Series, there was a picture uh, named, there was a pitcher who would hop over the third base line. He would never step foot on the third base line going to the dugout. We're filled with superstitions, guys. Think about it. Because you might read this stuff and you might go, how foolish. I want a bunch of nonsense. Really? Do you maybe have any superstitions yourself? The zodiac sign? Reading your horoscope? Ladders? Black cats? 
Friday the 13th? Who cares? It's Friday the 13th. Bring it on. Let's get it over so we be one day closer to God. You see, as we study this church, we're going to see that they were commended for their faith. Yet we're also going to see that it was a tolerant church. Remember, as a Christian, you're labeled as intolerant. They were a tolerant church which allowed the morals of the day to infect it. And that, hap that is happening today in our culture. The morals of the day are infecting the church, but the church is supposed to be doing what? Affecting the culture. But instead, the church is allowing the culture to infect, bring disease into the church. We're to go out and affect, bring the gospel, the good news, that you can be saved from all diseases. Paul has this to say. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 says, Your glorying is not good. I'll talk more about this later on. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And the reason why I put this up here, and I'll talk about it more later, is leaven is symbolic of sin at times in the Bible. And so as you're reading this, you basically want to realize Paul is talking about a lump, leaven, leaven representing sin. Okay, in context of chapter 5 here. That you know, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. How does God see us from heaven to earth? As holy, unblameable, unreprovable. But we're still sinners, unfortunately. So from earth to heaven, we sin. We need to ask for forgiveness. But we should be sinning less as we mature in the face. faith. We'll never be sinless until we take our last breath. Then it'll be over. And everyone will say, here lies a sinless person. Because we're in heaven. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, has, was sacrificed for us. Therefore... Let us keep the feast, not only not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, it only takes a little bit of compromise, as we're looking at the compromising church, it only takes a little bit of compromise or leaven or sin, allowing sin to come into our lives or into the church to infect our lives or affect the whole church. Again, please keep this in mind as we go through this letter to the compromising church. Every letter we need to evaluate our own lives by on a regular basis. So verse 12, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel, the messenger, the pastor, and to the pastor of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. We know that Jesus is speaking here as we see him reference back to what he shared with John in chapter 1, and I believe that this sharp two-edged sword represents what? The Word of God. Ephesians 6.17. Please write these verses down. We turn to our Bibles often, but on these really a lot of information days, we don't turn, we just reference them. So write it down. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Notice, capital S. So what is the sword of the Spirit? which is the Word of God. Interesting. Again, Matt and I did not coordinate this. The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. How about Hebrews 12, two, uh, 4, 12 through 13? For the Word of God is living and powerful. It is the only book that is living and powerful. The Quran is not living. It's not powerful. Matter of fact, it divides. It wants to kill. The Book of Mormon... It's not living. It's false. It's been changed. There's nothing that can back up the Book of Mormon. Absolutely nothing. But the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. For you new believers, that means your soul. Like when you might say something to someone, you're lying or you're trying to persuade them, and you think you're getting away with it, but something in them is just going, yeah, something's not right. But they don't know your heart. I don't know your heart. The Bible says my heart's desperately wicked, so we want to be careful judging, but there's that Holy Spirit that, that gives, sometimes gives you a check 
Well, that Holy Spirit knows exactly what that person is doing. Manipulation, lying, speaking the truth, speaking encouragement, whatever it might be, the Holy Spirit knows. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The him here is Jesus, because the Bible tells us that we're all going to stand before Jesus at the Bema seat of Christ, the reward seat of Christ. So whatever we do, you know, why did you come here today? Well, it's a thing to do on a Sunday morning. None of us might know that at all. You know who knows? The Holy Spirit, God, Jesus. So if you're just playing a religious game and you're a Christian, you need to repent. This is not a game. This is reality. This is the faith. You might have to die. And if it doesn't come to death in America, it's definitely, we've seen it in the last two or three years, unless you've been under a rock. We've seen it over the last two or three years, what happens to Christian doctors, to Christian nurses, to Christian truck drivers, to Christian teachers that will not succumb to the agenda. We've seen what's happened. Christian military personnel. It's to destroy America and it's to destroy Christianity. That's not going to happen. But it's, it's happening in, right in front of us. You see, if I was previously stated in weeks past, we will all be judged according to the what? The word of God. Not according to Calvary Chapel. You're going, to be, you're going to be judged according to the word of God. That's why it's so important for me as a pastor to give you the whole word of God. So be wise for each and every believer to know the word of God to the best of their abilities. You're not going to stand before Jesus and say, well, where's Pastor Jim? He'll vouch for me. You're not going to think that at all. It's going to be you and Jesus. It's going to be me and Jesus. One-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball. Ignorance of the teachings found within the word is never an acceptable excuse. And I think most of you know this in your workplace. If you do something against company policy, the first time they might say, if it was a little thing, the first time they might say, okay, well, you know what, you didn't know. Now you know, don't do that again. You come in, you do it the next day. What's going to happen? So, you know, you're not going to stand before God and say, well, you know what, I just didn't have time to read my Bible. I'm, I'm so sorry. You're going to heaven. Praise God. Get, grow up. Get that off the table. But do you want to go broke? Because God says in the Bible that you have an account. What's in your account? How are you building your account? Jesus said, Jesus said, store up treasure in heaven. Now, I'm planning for retirement. I doubt I'll ever see it. Social Security will probably be gone. But I'm still planning. So, so if you're here, this has nothing to do with weirdness or sell everything and give it to God. None of that nonsense. Stick around for a while. You'll figure it out. It's called balance. Balance. We will invest so much on this side of heaven that's going to burn and very little for the other side, which is going to last forever. You might want to change that up. You might want to really do some self-evaluation and change that up. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you strength to read and to understand what is written. Verse 13, I know your works. Praise God. This is wonderful. This is the third church. Maybe for you today, it's your first time here. So this is the first church. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. This is Jesus speaking. Now, Satan can only be in one place at one time. He is a created being in eternity past. He, is an, he was an angel. He is an angel. He is a fallen angel. He fell due to pride. Middle letter of pride is I. The middle letter of sin, I. He wanted to dethrone God, so he was cast out. So we want to be very, very careful here where Satan's throne is. His throne could be around this world, but he can only be at, at one time. There's all kinds of kingdoms around this world. But a king or a prince or a president, whatever name you, title you want to put on that individual, can only be at one place at one time. They might have multiple thrones, but they're only going to be at one place at one time. The days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. 
Once again, Jesus makes this statement, which could be wonderful as well as penetrating. I mean, this could be wonderful. I know your works. Thank you, God. I'm, I'm so glad you know my works. You might want to read the Italian prophet Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. And you might want to write down 316. Look it up when you get home, Malachi 316. You're going, to be, you're going to be blessed. Don't look it up now. Write it down. Remember, Jesus was in the midst of the churches back then and is in the midst of our church today. He knows what is going on, and so let's pay attention to what he is going to share with this church. We don't know for sure who this Antipas is, but his name means against all, against all. But we do know that he was a faithful Christian. We just read it, even unto death. He could have been a previous pastor of the church of Paramas and was willing to give the flock that same example that so many others gave before him. To lay down your life. To lay down your life for the Lord's testimony. That Jesus said, I am God. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. People will knock on your door. The Bible never says Jesus is God. The Bible never says Jesus is... They're lying to you. Read your Bible over and over and over again. You will see Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. God's one and only Son. So we have this man who Jesus recognizes as being a faithful martyr. And again, Jesus then commends some in the church of holding on to his name and not denying the Christian faith. Notice, I said some. Because as we're going to see, there were others in the church who were not hanging on to the name of Jesus and who were not walking according to doctrinal truths of the faith. But it opened the church to heresy or false teaching. You know, it's very interesting as well to notice that Jesus calls this false doctrine exactly what it is. The place where Satan dwells. The place where Satan dwells. Anyone that tries to cause division amongst races, BLM, that's the place where Satan dwells. And if it's in your heart as a Christian, you are allowing the spiritual enemy to come and influence over your life that should not be there because there is only one race, the human race. But if you haven't noticed, the enemy is consistently and constantly trying to divide people. It's all about the color of your skin. And if you're a white male right now in America, you are on a hit list. You don't even need to apply for a job. As soon as you walk, oh, you're white. No. Or maybe you checked off the box, Caucasian. They're not even going to call you for an interview. Companies have boldly come out and made that statement. Now they're retracting it because they know lawsuits are coming. But they've already said it. The cat's out of the bag. So is it possible for a church to enter into a relationship with the spiritual enemy of God and still be called a church? Is that possible? We're reading it. It's called Pergamos. We're reading it. This is a church. Jesus didn't say, oh, by the way, you're not a church. No, Jesus said to the pastor of the church. So this was still a church. Even though some in this church were commended for their faithfulness, the church as a whole was what we'd call apostate or had fallen into apostasy. Now, what is apostasy? Apostasy refers to the rejection of Christianity by someone who is formerly call, called a Christian. The term apostasy comes from the Greek word apostasia, meaning defection, departure, Revolt or rebellion. It has been described as a willing falling away from or rebellion against Christian truth or what is called doctrine. Apostasy. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So here is the judgment put out against this church, apostasy. And what was the apostasy? What was it specifically? There were those within the church who tolerated, 
who tolerated or were accepting of sexual misconduct taking place within the church. You see, we find this happening in the church in Corinth, where a man was having sexual relationship outside of marriage with his stepmother, as you do the studying. So they had accepted the fact this, that this man was having sex outside of marriage, and they not only accepted it, they endorsed it. Are you hearing that at all as far as your Christianity and what you have to do to those who come against us with their philosophies? It used to be, okay, okay, you're over there. Just go over there and do your own thing. No, 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 no. It's no longer just do your own. No, no. They're in your face. You have to accept us. And not only do you have to accept us, you better endorse us or we're going to cancel you. We're going to harass you. We might come to your house and break your windows. We'll follow you home. We know where you live. If you don't think this is happening in America and the FBI is doing zero about it, it's happening in America and the FBI is doing zero about it. Now, if you go to a school board meeting and speak up about what you don't think should be in the school, pornography in books, the FBI is going to be all over you. Oh, you're one of those. Okay, we got your number. We'll keep an eye on you. Paul rebuked them sharply and instructed them to put the man out of the church until he repented of that type of behavior. So we can see beliefs will affect behavior. What we believe will impact our future decisions. Let that sink in. Even as a Christian, as we're going over these books here, what I believe will affect my behavior. If I believe it's okay to steal, then I'm going to go into a store and steal. If I believe nobody's going to do anything about it, then I'm going to take a garbage bag into the store, fill the garbage bag up, and walk out the front door with the garbage bag. Are we seeing that in America at all? Hello? Stores are closing down. They're losing so much money. No beliefs. I mean, think of our society. I mean, what do you believe? Do you believe you should steal? I mean, majority of society believes you shouldn't steal because all of us could go in the store. Who's going to stop us? You've probably seen the videos where they go into a Circle K, 100 youth that are just having a quiet meeting. No, they're rioters where they go in and trash the, the store, steal as much as they can, break windows, trash it. Oh, no, they're just, you know, they're just expressing themselves. It's hot outside. They don't know what hot is. Come to Phoenix. Well, they're young. You know, I was young once, and I was taught by my dad, you steal something of somebody's that's not yours, you're going to get the backhand of fellowship. <laughs> he wasn't a Christian, so it wasn't a sweet fellowship. It was called a consequence. But that's all part of the anarchy that's coming to America to overthrow America. That is why our spiritual enemy is trying so hard to get the church to accept evil as being good. Well, how is that? What, what might that be? How about homosexuality? How about abortion? How about cohabitation? Living together like you're married when you're not. Having sex outside of marriage. How about drugs? Alcohol? How about endorsing drag queens? Are we seeing this come into any churches in America? How about ordaining deviant ministers? You see, the church should be the last place where evil is encouraged. So if the enemy can win that battle, which he ultimately won't win, then the world will be free to do whatever it wants. And they're looking so forward to that. When the rapture happens, oh my. Remember, Christianity was new to a culture immersed in sexual immorality. And it appears in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, read it. That the brother in Corinth did repent, but judgment was still pronounced upon, by him by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Why do I bring that up? Well, in our verse here, Jesus makes reference to an Old Testament situation between a king and the nation of Israel. So as you're reading your Bible, you want to maybe do a little further study. Who's this Balaam? Who's this Balak? It's in your Bible. Read your Bible. You see, it was as the nation of Israel was moving towards the promised land, they came to the east side of the Jordan, 
which they had come to 38 years earlier and couldn't go in because of disbelief. And they camped opposite of Jericho. The area was known as Moab, and the king that at that time was known as Balak. So the Balak here was a king. You'll read it in Numbers 22 through 24. Again, Numbers. You want to read your whole Bible. Numbers 22 through 24. Balak had heard about a man, a prophet of God, who could place curses upon people. And the man's name was Balaam. Balaam. So Balak sent his servants to hire Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. When Balaam came, he only pronounced what God commanded him to pronounce, which was blessings. This got King Balak very, very upset three times. And Balaam told him, read it yourself, I told you I could only say what God called me to say. If you had given me a house full of gold, it wouldn't have mattered. I could only say what God told me to say. And so he did that. Very sad situation. Balaam, though, came up with another idea, which we see at the end of this verse. Notice at the end of verse 14. And to commit sexual immorality. Committing sexual immorality is not having an affair. First of all, it's not called an affair. It's called adultery. You're married, you have sex with someone else outside of that marriage union, that's adultery. It's not an affair. It's adultery. Having sex outside of marriage, that's called fornication. Any sex outside of marriage. Take your most beautiful woman, so this is the idea that Balaam came up with. Take your most beautiful women and send them to the camp of the Israelites. The men will go crazy over their beauty and have sexual relations with them. It's called fornication. This scheme actually worked, and they not only did have sex with these foreign women, but these men bowed down and offered worship to the idols that these women brought with them into the camp of the Israelites. This was towards the end of their wandering years in the desert. The nation of Israel was just about ready to enter the promised land. They have seen miracle after miracle after miracle, 40 years of miracles, and yet some still fell into sin, some. It's an important lesson for us today as a church. You see, the church at Pergamos was accepting into the church inappropriate sexual behavior as well as the practice of false worship, false idols. Because again, I think when we think of the early church, we probably don't think of things like this. We probably think that they had it easy, living in a culture that was accepting of their beliefs and a society that basically left them alone. Well, as we've been seeing over the last few weeks, nothing could be further from the truth. You see, it was very hard to live the Christian faith in this type of culture. That's why you want to read your Bible, young people. That's why you want to read your Bible, because people are saying, you know, it's irrelevant, it's archaic, it's not true, blah, 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 blah. You know why they get so upset about it? Because of conviction. Because of responsibility. Because if they really believe that the Bible is true, that would make them responsible, and then that would make them accountable. So they have to mock it and ridicule it. Especially when the culture was willingly brought into the church, willingly brought into the church, or what Jesus called, and appropriately called, the throne of Satan. I mean, that's just incredible. These are the words of Jesus, guys, not mine. He is calling the church at Pergamos. You have a throne of Satan in your midst, and you're not doing anything about it. Verse 15. Thus you have also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, I've mentioned this before, but you might be new. As I mentioned last week, there's not a lot of information about the Nicolaitans, but we, it is believed, possibly, that they could have come through Nicholas, who was a deacon in the early church. It is also believed that he went apostate and encouraged loose living and other word. In other words, eat, drink, and be merry. Not very probable. Basically, what it is most likely is it started, the early church started to create a hierarchy of the church by having the ministers lording over the laity. 
We talked about this last week. Nicolaitans could have been derived from two Greek words, Nikan, which meant to conquer, and Laos, which meant people. Now, here's an interesting fact. Balaam could be derived from two Hebrew words, Bila, which meant to conquer, and Heam, which meant people, conquer the people. So Nicholas and Balaam would then be the Greek and Hebrew forms of the same name, descriptive of each instance of an evil teacher who had influence over the people and brought them into bondage through heresy. Still happening today, unfortunately. Verse 16, the exhortation. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them. Notice, fight against them. Who are the them? Those who are accepting into the church this idol worship and this, this sexual immorality. I will fight against them with what? With the sword of my mouth. And we learned what is the sword of his mouth? With what? The word of God. And that's why we try to teach here verse by verse through the word of God so that you'll have the ability to evaluate your own life, to evaluate our church, and then to have an evaluation of others where you, we can help them come to know Jesus as their Savior. Jesus was holding those within the church accountable and he was calling them to turn from their evil ways. And it's a sad commentary to a church that existed in the first century as it's only been roughly 60 years since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 60 years. But here we are 1,900 years later after this was written, a little bit over 1,900 years, and we see a similar thing happening within the church universal. Now we see a generation of parents who are confronted with the sin of their children. And we have to ask ourselves, are we, the parents, we have to ask ourselves, this is such a sad state of the church, but this is reality. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to lay aside our relationship with our children or maybe our grandchildren for the sake of the Christian faith? In America, in 2023, this is now, and it might not be for you because you don't even have kids yet, but for many of us who have older adult children in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, or maybe you're having children in the teen years with all this social media nonsense, and you're having to deal with this. I mean, I dealt with it when our children were teenagers in a different way, but I had to deal with it. And you have to deal with it. Am I willing to leave the faith? Am I willing to set it aside because I love my child so much I don't want to lose that relationship? Guys, this is real in America, and this is real in the church. It's happening. It's even happening within this church. So this isn't some hypothetical thing 10 years from now. This is today. This is happening today. And you as a parent, you have to determine, am I going to stick with the faith or am I going to stick with my child? Are we willing to compromise our witness for Christ in order to not lose a relationship with our compromising child? The Bible talks about this in Isaiah. Read the early Isaiah. In the latter days, women are going to be ruling and children are going to be ruling. Women are going to be ruling and children are going to be ruling. Is that happening today in our society? Where you can have a hard drive in the bathroom and get away with it? Or where you in second or third grade can accuse your teacher? This just happened this past week. We know the people personally. Where a child, and in, in, I think they were in third grade, falsely accused the teacher, and the teacher almost got fired because the parents came down and were so mad that that teacher would touch their child. Fortunately, the school had videotape, so they quickly watched the videotape. False accusations, total false accusations. What happened to the child? Zero. What happened to the parent who came down and demanded, the mom, by the way, who came out and demanded that that teacher be fired now for touching my, what happened to that? Zero. Nothing. Guys, this is our society. You better be aware of what's going on in your schools. You might want to really seriously think about homeschooling. 
We're in desperate, desperate days. We have to be careful. It's definitely not easy being a Christian these days, but as we are studying, it wasn't easy then. You see, if we, and I'm speaking to those who are mature in the faith now, speaking to those who are mature in the faith, if we do not hold on to a biblical standard of what is acceptable, if the pastor of a church does not hold on to what is biblically, doctrinally sound, where is the church going to go? the way of the world, of what is acceptable or unacceptable in the eyes of God, then who will? Are we really going to expect the next president to make this a Christian nation? Are you really seriously thinking that? We're in desperate days. We're in exciting days. Jesus is coming back. I've been waiting 46 years for this. I'm getting more and more excited every day. It's grieving. I, I read the scriptures and I go, righteous lot? Wait a minute, God. Righteous lot? Read your Bible. It's in your Bible. Righteous lot. He was vexed with what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. Grieved. Are you grieved? I'm not talking about grieved to where you, you know, I just got to get away and live off the land and I'm going to... No, 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 none of that nonsense. We got to be the light in our culture. We can't run away and hide. We need to be the light. But we don't have to accept the darkness. Verse 17, he who has an ear, are your spiritual ears open? I believe many of you, if not all of you, are. But maybe there's one or two in here that aren't. You know, you're just kind of like, yeah, whatever. I can't wait to go to lunch. He was an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches, to all the churches. We've gone through two, now three. Not just to this church, but all the churches. You and I as a Bible-believing Christian, are we ready to repent? You see, Jesus was holding those within the church accountable, and he was calling them to turn from their evil ways. It's a sad commentary. But it's a reality. Again, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit, says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, that's kind of weird, hidden manna. We'll get to it. And I will give him a white stone, hmm, white stone, and a stone on a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Very important. The hidden manna is reference to the bread of life, Jesus. In John chapter 6, read John chapter 6. Jesus said that he was the bread that came down from heaven and that true believers would partake of his body and his blood. John chapter 6. Of course, they took that as cannibalism. It was not. It was not about cannibalism. But it was symbolic representation of what we celebrate every time we participate in communion. That Jesus satisfies every spiritual desire that we might have. It's hidden from the world. They don't understand. Why do you go to church? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you do devotions? Why do you listen to Christian music? Why, 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 why? It's hidden. The agenda that is taking place is found in the scriptures, but how many people are looking for it? No, they'd rather trust in a political party, a social agenda, or a certain news outlet. You know, keep reading your Bible. The prophecies and promises. We sang about it this morning, didn't we? Wasn't that one of the last lines? Yeah. Your promises, promises your promises won't fail. The prophecies and promises found in the word of God are all going to come to pass. So there are two meanings that make the most sense about this white stone. In that culture, the participants in the jury would use a white and black stone to pass judgment upon a person. After hearing the facts, they would take the black stone and place it in a jar for guilty. They would take the white stone and place it in a jar for innocent. For the believer, we are innocent before our Father in heaven because of the precious blood of Christ, as we see in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you are sanctified, you are set apart. But you are justified, just as if I never sinned, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Holy Spirit of our God, the triunity of the Godhead there. There is also the practice of placing a name upon a white stone and then inviting that person to a social event. Think of it as getting an invitation to a wedding. Now, in the old days, I'm talking, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you got an invitation to the wedding, you, 
at least one or two that I went to, you literally had to take the invitation to show that you were invited. It's very similar here. The person would then bring that white stone with their name written on it to gain access to the event. Maybe the new name is referenced here, and there's a heavenly name that we'll use in addition to our earthly name and then use it throughout eternity. We really don't know. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven to find out. But what we do know is that every believer has been found innocent, praise God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And every believer has their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Read your Bible. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that we will receive a white stone and a new name written on it. We're invited to the Supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So we'll wrap it up with a few questions for you and I. Got to make it applicable, right? Don't zip up your Bible. You've just gotten a lot of information. How can we make it applicable? Is there a compromise within my life? You don't have to dig. This is not psychology. You don't have to go back to your childhood. It's talking about today. Is there a compromise in my life? Is there a compromise within our church? Do you see compromise within the church? Please come to us lovingly, kindly, privately. Let us know. We'll talk about it. We'll address it. Are we as individuals learning more about and staying close to doctrinal truth? Well, I don't want to be unloving. So what, you'd rather love somebody to hell and not tell them what they're doing is wrong? Is that more loving, loving somebody to hell? That's not loving at all. Are we keeping our eyes focused on Jesus or are we focused upon the world? Pergamos, what were they getting focused on? The world. And the world came in and infected them. Are we staying focused on doctrinal truth as a church or are we willing to compromise for the sake of unity with the world? That is happening. That is happening in our world today. Father, we thank you and praise you that we're just visiting this planet. And we can have a certain amount of unity. We're to love, and yes, when we go to our workplace, we're to have unity with our work. We're to be kind, we're to be gentle, we're to be all of those attributes of the Holy Spirit. But Father, we're not to have unity with darkness. We're not to condone a coworker's sin. We're not to celebrate in a neighbor's sin. So Father, give us strength. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit that we will not allow compromise into our lives and that we'll lovingly, lovingly talk to others about the compromise in their lives that we might first take the beam out of our own eye, that we might take the speck out of our brother's eye. Thank you, Father, for your word. You call us to judge, but you call us to judge with grace and mercy. And then you tell us to speak the truth in love, agape love, that they might come to know God, that they might come to know Jesus as their Savior, that they might receive the Holy Spirit and get saved. Use us this week, Father, in a world that is spinning, spinning so fast towards the last days. Give us wisdom. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we all stand.